medium battle mechs are some of the most frequent weight classes deployed by the Inner Sphere for much of its history. Often these machines are mechs of compromise. Compromising speed, or firepower, or armor to achieve the mission of the battle mech in question. While this is true of all mechs, in essence, the advanced clan battle mechs that would invade the Inner Sphere demonstrated that this balance of speed and firepower could be radically changed. And in my opinion, none more so than their medium battle mechs. Often overlooked by fans, but fatally done so on the tabletop. In this video, we're going to be examining another mech known for its deployments with Clan Ghost Bear, and referred to by the Inner Sphere as the Dragonfly. This video will cover... The Viper. A medium mech weighing in at 40 tons, the Viper is an incredibly vicious battle mech which can deliver lethal attacks to medium and light mech forces. While this mech is known by many for its drawbacks, there is often something misunderstood about clan technology, which is bluntly that their lightest weaponry is typically their most dangerous and remarkably so. The Viper would begin its existence in the 30th century, in 2940, as Clan Fire Mandrel's first foray into Omnimech design for mobility and striking power. While this wasn't wholly successful, it did still yield a relatively competent and worthwhile design, but one which the Mandrels themselves had left with teething problems. To take pause from the Viper itself, and to talk about the clan that deployed it for a moment, the Mandrels are one of the lesser-known clans. To be clear, they are still one of the founding original clans, but they never participated directly in the clan invasion of the Inner Sphere. And even when it came to the clan homeworlds, they were often more internally concerned. The Mandrels, in fact, were almost constantly challenging themselves more than anyone else, which would genuinely result in their doom during the Wars of Reaving. After failing to join the clan invasion, the only truly noteworthy thing they did, beyond being an origin point for several clan mech designs which proliferated through the invasion force, was fight against the Capellan Confederation in the Great Refusal, which they decisively lost due to a lack of coordination between their units. After this, they would participate bitterly in the clan homeworlds, attempting to reverse the Great Refusal no less. They would briefly have the Ilkhan ship, which would end in humiliation, before the Mandrels became unstable, fought one another, were embroiled in battles with other clans, and eventually the Society, the Dark Casts, and even themselves again, before they simply vanished, with their blood names being absorbed into Clan Star Adder after their deaths. Their deaths happened silently almost. The other clans barely even noticed. This is also noteworthy because it means that the Viper has outlived its creators, by being distributed throughout the clans themselves. During the first 60 years of its existence, the Viper would have had a mixed reputation, and would mostly be seeing usage with its originators. Omnipod mechanism flaws and perceived design problems resulted in the Fire Mandrels looking at other options for their medium mech forces. Eventually, they almost dropped the mech altogether, and opted to make a trade with Clan Ghost Bear. The Bears had an incredibly desirable mech with an intense reputation known as the Executioner, a 95-ton assault mech. Looking to bolster their own Tumen with more of these machines, Clan Fire Mandrel traded the schematics for the Viper, along with the entirety of its production facilities in exchange for a large number of product runs of the Executioner Battle Mech. The Bears, much like with the Fire Moth, saw the value in the Viper, and how it could be used in their own military doctrines, and accepted the deal. This deal even led to Clan Ghost Bear discovering how to more effectively disassemble factories and relocate them, something which would help the Ghost Bears in their eventual exodus back to the Inner Sphere once they decided to abandon the Kerensky Cluster and Pentagon Worlds. The first thing Ghost Bear did was of course troubleshoot their new design, and attempted to resolve the Omnipod issues. Afterwards, they made the determination that the Viper, due to the design, would serve as a superb escort for the Fire Moth battle mechs. This medium mech, weighing as much as two Fire Moths, 
is built on many of the same principles, but not all the same. It has an extremely large engine for its size and is incredibly fast as a result. It is also extremely well armored in contrast to the Fire Moth, making it not only fast, but exceptionally tough and durable, offsetting some of the weaknesses of its 20-ton stablemate. Even then, when in the hands of clan warriors, they viewed it mostly as a failure due to its limited firepower capabilities. Even the Ghost Bears themselves considered it to be limited in this function. Despite that, they continued to produce the design and didn't shelve it. It was found, much like the Fire Moth, that this fast-moving striker and skirmisher benefited exceptionally when employed in a combined arms role. When supporting elementals, tanks, VTOLs, and lighter mechs, its best qualities came out. This was proven militarily in the Combine Ghost Bear War, in fact, resulting in the battle mech seeing a return to favor within the Rossel Hague Dominion, after its mediocre showing during the latter portions of the clan invasion or during the dual-centric conflicts of the clans. With the decline of Zelbringen, the Viper has truly been able to show its fangs. When able to field this mech, the Hell's Horses have also come to favor it themselves, though they are dependent on trade from Rosselhaig or middlemen such as Clan Seafox in order to acquire new variants of this mech. They do also capture them in border skirmishes as well, and there doesn't appear to be a major first-party trade pipeline to get them direct access to new versions of this mech, due to its production facilities being in the Rosselhaig Dominion, after their departure from the Kerensky Cluster. Now, the Viper is poised to continue to battle the enemies which the Dominion possesses. Most recently, it would fight in the ruthless and brutal civil war on the decision to join, or not to join, the third Star League. And now, once more, the Vipers have poured into the realm of the Draconis Combine as the bears assault the dragon. The first 40-ton clan Omnimech viewed by the Inner Sphere during the invasion now has a record spanning 100 years within this territory. And while its reputation during this time is mixed, with the new age of warfare, it has an ample opportunity to deliver where it may not have before. Given its potential, and given its functionality, it would be foolish to assume it won't, or cannot. The Viper, like many of its fellow breakout, first recorded Omnimech counterparts represented an immense change in how battles were waged. Traditionally, 40-ton battle mechs in the Inner Sphere would be put into the role of either being light hunters, infantry support battle mechs, or often just misplaced battle mech ideas. This tonnage brackage of medium mechs is largely derided, and interestingly, the Dragonfly, as it is called by the Inner Sphere, follows this development path, but with one key difference. The technology the Dragonfly has on board is incredibly powerful, which masks the limitations of this kind of design, and indeed enhances this approach as well. Much like all Omnimex, the Viper can be re-equipped with ease, as long as there are available Omnipod configuration components to be installed into the machine at hand. This means it can be adjusted for a myriad number of roles and be made ready for combat at a very quick notice, even in a changing strategic situation. These mechs are, however, resource intensive to support, and worse, if they are knocked out, even for the clans, they can prove difficult to replace in short order, should there not be a readily available replacement to hand. Being an Omnimech, this does mean that the Viper has its base engine, internal structure, armor, and base systems installed, but has tonnage that is considered to be pod space that is available for modular systems to inhabit, and this tonnage is used to inform the various configurations which it has. Like many of the clan lights, mediums, and heavy mechs, this mech comes installed with clan endo steel which reduces the weight of the internal structure from 4 tons down to 2 tons. This, however, does come at the expense of critical spaces inside the battle mech, and despite saving the same tonnage as the Inner Sphere's Endo Steel, Clan Endo Steel takes up less critical spaces on board, leaving more slots open to install other components and upgrades. 
Even during the clan invasion, standard gyros and standard cockpits are the norm for clan battle mechs, and the Dragonfly is no different in this respect. For onboard electronic systems, things become a little bit more interesting. The Viper comes installed with a Series D8CC-25X communications array and a Sloan 220 lockover target and tracking system. The latter gives the Viper an incredibly powerful quirk in the advanced rules, in the form of the improved targeting long-range quirk. This stunning quirk means when firing weapons at long range, the Dragonfly in fact gets a bonus of 1 to hit a target, meaning instead of suffering a 4 negative modifier for long-range attacks, it in essence only suffers a 3 modifier for such assaults. This is an extremely potent quirk. Better yet, it also comes equipped with the Narrow Quirk, making the Dragonfly harder to hit with ranged attacks. As a correction, in an update to the rules in the latest iteration of the Battletech manual, Narrow no longer makes it one harder to hit at range, but instead incoming attacks which barely hit the target, by dice rules, are turned into glancing blows, reducing damage. These two quirks in tandem are extremely powerful in game, and can be battle winning if the advanced rules are used. If you are using a Viper, remember them well, as they just might be your gateway to victory. Much like many derided battle mechs of the Succession Wars era, the Viper makes an enormous investment into its mobility and power plant. Equipped with an 11.5 ton 320 light force Clan XL engine, the Dragonfly has an enormous maximum speed of 129 kilometers per hour, or 12 movement points in the tabletop game. This raw speed makes it faster than many light mechs and it uses more or less an XL version of the engine which powers the Cicada battle mech. This means it is more than capable of tracking down smaller, lighter assets which can't keep up with it in terms of firepower and durability. Better yet, it is equipped with permanently mounted jump jets, namely an 8-jet installed system of Geotech 300 thrusters. This gives it an enormous jump potential of 240 meters, or 8 movement points in the tabletop game, making it capable of almost sailing through the air across the battlefield, jumping at the same speed as many inner sphere mediums in terms of their ability to run. In a dueling situation, this is incredibly useful, as this superior mobility can allow for repositioning, flanking, or retreating on behalf of the Viper, giving it time to strike or regroup as needed, even against heavier battle mechs. Where it really shines, however, is in the Inner Sphere's way of warfare. When moving against formations, it can use the superior speed to ambush or flank enemy units, or perform vicious hit-and-run attacks without concerns regarding honor. This speed also means that it can act as a recon mech against slower forces, or be used to back up infantry, battle armor, and lighter mechs in more vicious high-speed battles known to take place on the frontiers of most worlds. As the clans, particularly Ghost Bear, have slowly withdrawn from the ways of Zelbrian, the attributes of the Viper have become more desirable with time, and it works better and better on modern battlefields like the Dark Age and Ilkhan era. Like many lighter mechs, the Viper doesn't make any inherent investment into heat management, and thus has a standard 10 double heat sinks on board. These heat sinks will be found entirely within its massive 320XL engine. This configuration of heat sinks does typically fit the management of the Viper's limited pod space tonnage, and doesn't typically need to be added to unless variants put extreme heat demands on the system. The Viper makes a major investment in terms of its tonnage and onboard critical into physical protection, which is further enhanced by its massive speed and maneuverability as well. First, it comes with 7 tons of clan ferrofibrous plating on the battle mech giving it more than a respectable 134 points of armored protection. To give perspective, this gives it more protection in terms of points than the 65-ton Hellbringer. And though the latter is poorly invested in in this realm, it's nonetheless noteworthy that this medium mech is more closely armored to a light heavy than it is to a 40-ton medium. This comes from its advanced ferro fibers technology, as well as its significant weight investment as mentioned prior. Clan Feral Fibrous Armor does have a price, however, 
in that it fills physical space within the mech, just like endosteel internal structure does. Clan ferrofibrous not only offers more protection per point compared to its inner sphere equivalent, but it takes up significantly less critical at that. This is just yet another boon for the Viper. The Viper can take major weapons hits as a result, such as fire from an AC-10 or large laser, and not be at risk of being penetrated from a single strike in any of its most vital locations. Even heavier weapons, such as Gauss rifles or AC-20s, won't remove a leg or side torso in a single assault unless they roll exceptionally well on the critical table. When also factoring in its speed and jump capabilities, as well as using the advanced rules of its narrow profile perk, the Viper is an insanely tough and rugged opponent to deal with. While jumping, it can routinely be far more difficult to hit on movement alone. And if it runs more than 10, it can also be just as hard to tag with incoming weapons fire. Even when that fire lands, it may only be a glancing blow, or it may be shirked off by the Viper's impressive protection. To take down this mech is no easy feat for any machine. Every mech must make sacrifices along the way, as mentioned before. Some battle mechs sacrifice armor for speed and firepower. Some sacrifice speed for protection and firepower. Others sacrifice firepower for speed and protection. While the Viper does try to strike a balance between these three, it inevitably leans more so into the latter camp than the former's, and is one of the reasons why so many clan pilots have come to resent this machine while they were fighting in the ways of the clans. What this means is that for a 40-ton mech, the Viper can often feel undergunned, as it only has 8.5 tons available for systems which aren't built directly into the battle mech from the get-go. By contrast, the Adder, which weighs 5 tons less, has 16 tons of available pod space. But it's also noteworthy that it moves 30 kilometers per hour slower and doesn't natively jump. It leans more into firepower, while the Viper leans into speed and protection. All the same, this is what it has to work with. And fortunately for it, clan lighter weapons offer an enormous return on tonnage investment. Much like the Fire Moth, the Viper has 17 configurations, so I will not be covering all of them, just a few select ones that I will be reviewing here. The most common version of the Viper during the clan invasion and beyond is the Prime, meant for doing close quarters brawling while offering infantry support. First, to enhance its protective capabilities, it has an anti-missile system on board, which helps it manage incoming missile attacks. Next, it has a pair of machine guns, which will help it erode enemy mechs which get into extremely close distances by chipping away their armor or crit seeking, or they act as a superb massacring tool for enemy infantry forces, which may attempt to overwhelm, ambush, or otherwise impede the battle mech. These are mounted in its right torso, as well as its machine gun ammunition, which is protected by the clan chassis inherently as they possess a case by default. To get into its prime anti-mech systems, to start with, it comes with a pair of extremely accurate clan medium pulse lasers. These hit with a two bonus modifier at each range bracket. They also go further than inner sphere medium lasers, and on top of that, they do seven damage each, almost as much as an inner sphere large laser. These punch holes into lighter targets with ease, and become increasingly lethal as the Viper closes in on its victim. Both of these lasers are mounted in its right arm. To help this system, it has an SRM-4, which will fire scatter damage at targets and look to exploit damaged areas already hit by the pulse lasers. This is mounted in the left arm, and has one ton of ammunition as well, giving it 25 rounds of fire. The Prime tries to strike a balance between its priorities of attack, but it's by no means bad once it engages in a brawling match with a less maneuverable enemy especially when it is in support of battle armor or infantry. While not perfect by any means, it's hard to hit, durable, and can pick away at its intended prey until it scores dangerous hits, or begins to position itself to its enemy's rear arc. This configuration is made even more powerful when it is not engaging in duels, but is instead engaging in real battlefield situations, as with all Viper configurations. One of the more traditional damage-seeking variants of the Viper is the A configuration, 
It doesn't install any particularly exciting weapon systems, and instead invests in reliable, tried and tested light systems that offer it the best return on tonnage. Albeit resulting in it running very hot should it not cycle its weaponry appropriately. It is simply armed with five Clan ER medium lasers. With two in the left torso, two in the right torso, and one in the right arm. Then, for crit seeking, it has a left arm mounted SRM-6 with one ton of ammunition, using an Artemis IV fire control system. This variant is simple and straightforward, though again, it can run very hot, and may struggle to perform as needed as a result. Its range, though, is exceptional for a mid-range brawler, and with its long-range targeting quirk, it can actually reliably put out reasonable fire at long range with its ER medium lasers, which can hit with some real force against certain targets. There are a multitude of Viper configurations which take dedicated roles as infantry killers, such as the F variant, G variant, and J variant. But in the initial invasion, it is the C configuration which seems to take on the role of cleaning infantry from the field most effectively. It comes with four machine guns and a shocking 600 rounds of ammunition, with the guns themselves being mounted into the right and left torsos. These chew through infantry and can damage mechs in close, but it's not ideal for the latter. To back these up with more infantry killing ability, it has a total of three flamethrowers resulting in yet more carnage. Finally, it has twin ER medium lasers in its left arm if it needs to protect itself from any peer adversaries. Overall, this is one of the poor anti-infantry configurations, if only because it overinvests two vital tons into ammunition to be frank, which could have gone into enhancing it otherwise. It's very limited in its damage abilities. It does, however, have an active probe as well to find hidden targets or for it to circumvent electronic warfare. But this doesn't solve any of the problems that the C actually has. During the invasion era, if you come across a C, you're probably quite fortunate, unless you're a dedicated infantry force. The I configuration is a major shift towards peer destruction and light mech hunting for the Viper, and it leans heavily into some of the newer clan technologies to appear throughout the 31st century to do this. First, it installs a targeting computer, enhancing its accuracy at all ranges and allowing the Viper to make easier called shots if needed. For the purposes of protection, as with many other configurations in use, it comes with an anti-missile system once more to try to limit missile-based attacks against it. It also comes with a light active probe, once more allowing it to act as a better scout if needed. But where the damage starts is in the form of three heavy medium lasers. These have a range of a traditional inner sphere medium laser, but hit as hard as a Clan ER Large Laser, or an Inner Sphere PPC. This is an incredibly hard-hitting system for the mech to carry, and if not jumping, it can reliably fire them without overheating too badly. These are installed into the right arm and side torsos. The final piece of this is an ATM-3, which is an advanced tactical missile system. These offer it a diverse follow-up to its original attack, and once more looks to add scatter damage. It can be found in the left arm with one ton of ammunition. While the Ill Clan era and Dark Age do display a series of striker-centric and scout-centric configurations that would begin to appear for the Viper, it's interesting that a sniper, long-range support variant was created as well, and one with a fairly unique set of weapons. The L configuration may not hit the hardest, but it is still an interesting on-field harasser, to start with, it has three Streak LRM-5 launchers, which are its primary weapons, and it carries a total of 48 rounds of fire split between the three. These won't waste ammunition on shots the Viper can't make, so each turn it can reliably fire knowing that if it doesn't make its target, i.e. the player who uses the mech fails to roll to hit, no heat is generated and no ammunition is spent. Combined with the Viper's speed, this just means every single turn this thing can attempt to fire, and can take shots of opportunity on almost any dice rolls without any kind of worries. Jump 8 spaces to get out of a bad situation and needed defense modifiers? Fire some missiles. At long range and the target ran? Why not fire some LRMs? Maybe some of them will stick. Its long range targeting quirk makes this all the better. This mech is hard to corner, hard to disrupt, can always reposition, and it can basically harass constantly or land finishing blows on already damaged enemy mechs. It's better than one might believe, in fact. It's just a mech that has a very long game to play in a battle, 
wearing away enemies, or picking off ones which have already been harmed. Given that the Dragonfly is durable and fast, it can probably outlast a lot of its opposition. And noteworthy, as a backup, it has a pair of ER micro lasers in the right torso. As someone who fields medium mechs during the Succession War, and still uses fast mediums in the later eras, I can say with confidence that the Viper is not a mech to be ignored. Speed and durability, with maximizing movement modifiers, can be extremely hard to deal with, and extremely frustrating to an adversary with heavy weaponry, as they expend huge amounts of their heat budgets or ammunition to try to stop the harassment, or the flanking attacks that are ripping into their sides and rear armor. Often, commanders, mech warriors, and players want exciting explosions of energy for their offensive systems. But sometimes endurance, speed, and perseverance is what is really going to carry the day. The Viper serves its roles well across the board in most, though not all, of its configurations. When Clan Ghost Bear received this design from Clan Fire Mandrel, they inherited a mech which was in many ways future-proofed. Its speed and durability ensured it could always act as a light escort, recon hunter, a scout, and a brutal duelist, despite what clan warriors who couldn't see its potential thought about it. It delivers on the promises of many of the Inner Sphere's earlier designs, like the Clint, Sakata, Hermes, and Assassin, but it uses advanced clan technologies to ensure that it gets the most out of its limited weapons tonnage. Other clans do get access to this mech due to its long period of operation in the Inner Sphere and due to being near the bears in some way resulting in it being salvaged or repurposed, or through trade in some form, either direct or indirect, with the Ghost Bear Dominion. It can be seen in Clan Hell's Horses and the Scorpion Empire, outside of Rosselhaig itself, of course, the latter being Clan Ghost Bear in its current form. But still, this mech is in its own way quite the dealer of destruction. Whether it faces off in Trials, or faces off against other forces in traditional combat as it's waged in the Inner Sphere, it does have its virtues. Clan Fire Mandrel, in other words, didn't know what they were giving up. Which is fitting, given the fate of that clan and its overall behavior during their limited exposure in the setting. The Viper is an old mech by the time of the Ilclan era, and it has more than adapted and thrived in it. Thank you for joining me here today. If you were wondering where do I find the Viper in plastic and wanted to grab this mech and some others for yourself, it is available currently through the Clan Heavy Striker Star, which is a standard force pack by Catalyst Game Labs. I'll include a link in the video description and you can either get it through there or talk to your local game store if they have it in stock or you'd like to order it through them. But on a more important note, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently and you'll be happy with the content, I think. Also a huge thank you to all the YouTube members on this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel, and I can't thank you enough, because this content is really only possible because of viewers like you. And with that, I will catch all of you in the comment section below.